Shalom and welcome everyone. My name is Tony Pino and I am here with my good uh, brother uh, Mitch Chapman today and we are doing uh, session 26 on a Jew and Gentile discuss. And today we're going to be discussing Hebrews chapter 8 starting with verse 1. We went through you know, half of chapter 7 last time together. We're really kind of digging into the meaning of Yeshua as our Kohen Gadol as our high priest, and we are beginning to go ahead and relate that to the uh, the tabernacle or the temple or the institution of the offering system. And I think it's very important that uh, the terminology that we're going to be using today really kind of hits home with you guys. We're going to be looking at some things in chapter eight that uh, you know that are in italics. You got to be careful of those words that come in italics. Uh, because they're not in the original Greek. And I think, uh, and I haven't talked to Brother Mitch, but I know uh, he has touched on this before. So uh, this word sacrifice, I think we're going to have to uh, touch on that because it's an offering system. It's the offerings, uh, and we can touch on that. There is a difference between a sacrifice and an offering. Uh, and that will make a difference on what Yeshua did for us. He was our offering. He offered his life. Uh, for us, and that's why he has been granted to be our Kohen Gadol. So we're definitely going to be touching on a lot of that today. Uh, what exactly is the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, uh, wh how it relates to these chapters, um, and so forth. So it's going to be a really good, fun time today. We, One of the big reasons why we do this is so that you obviously get a balanced view. We have Brother Mitch, who is an ethnic Jew, and I am a Gentile, and we both uh, do our best to follow the Torah uh, in today's life, doing what we can with the available commandments that are, are available to us. And so we are working together to create, uh, and by the power of the Holy Spirit only, one new man. That's what Yeshua's desire is, is one new man, bringing the two people groups together, the nations and the nation of Israel, to walk hand in hand together in the kingdom. And so Yeshua tore down that middle wall of separation, that was between us, and that's a big reason why me and Brother Mitch are together today, is showing that we can walk hand in hand, we can do Torah together, and that the uh, the idea of the governmental system of Yeshua being Torah is for all. Amen. And it will be instituted firmly when he returns. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to my brother here. Uh, good morning, brother. I hope you are doing well way over there in Florida. I know your your weather's better than mine, so. <laughs> I see you but, are still bundled up. Uh, are you? Are you still bundled up? Yeah. Uh, you are. Um, yes, I am. Yeah, exactly. It's only in the 20s here. I, I think this morning when I woke up, it was only 68. Uh, now at around uh, quarter after 10 in the morning. Uh, it's probably in the somewhere in the 70s, uh, got to be probably mid 70s going to go up. And I and I hate to rub the weather uh, into people's face this time of year. If you're not down here in sunny, warm, delicious South Florida, <laughs> but uh, we'll be getting up into the low 80s again today and through the rest of the week. So. Um, as the old airline commercial was on the defunct uh, airline, actually two defunct airlines. The first one was Northeast Airline that became Eastern Airlines. And the first one, the, the commercial that I still resonates in my brain, a guy sitting at the pool uh, touting, come on down and on Northeast Airline. And that's how everybody came down to Florida. Anyway. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, two points uh, before we uh, jump in and begin with Hebrews 8 1 or, uh, 8, 8, 1, or Messianic Jews, uh, which is, I believe, more appropriate, 8 1, is the people have a misunderstanding, uh, I believe as to uh, people say, well, if you broke one, you broke them all. Yeah, that's, that's what James says, and that's true. Uh, it doesn't really relate to the Torah. It relates to a component of the Torah. That's a whole nother deep study, 
And I'm referring to the Book of the Covenant, the uh, then, which is from Genesis 1 through Exodus 24, 11. Then you have from Exodus 24, 12 to the end of the book. And this Shabbat is always leads up to the last parasha of Exodus, uh, Peduke. And uh, so from 2412 through chapter 40, we have in essence, the one time tabernacle instructions. There's other things sprinkled in there, but predominantly that's what it is. And then when we get to Leviticus one through the end of the Torah proper in Deuteronomy 34, we have what is called uh, not so much uh, highly regarded as such, but nonetheless, it's there. It's the book of the law. And you can see this. And people, when they hear this for the first time, oh, you froze up, Brother Mitch. Or we lost your, uh, nope, you are frozen. Dig into and to pull it out. And the biggest hint or the clearest uh, passage that you see it is actually in Deuteronomy 31, 26, because it says, and let me turn there real quick. Are you frozen, Tony? I'm you were frozen for a second there, so you were talking about the Book of the Law and the uh, Book of the Covenant, and I believe because you're going to Deuteronomy uh, uh, 31, verse 26, you're going to be talking about the Book of the Law. Right. Okay. So you're with me. I, I yep. saw your lips move uh, briefly. Yeah. At, at... yeah, you froze for about maybe two or three seconds there, maybe four seconds. Okay. So Deuteronomy, write this down, because this is really important. Deuteronomy. Nope, we froze again. There's something definitely going on with our uh, connection, whether it's my side or his side, I am. The direction, the instruction is. And put it beside, put it next to, put it alongside of what? The Ark of the Covenant. Well, wait a second. So the Torah that you're thinking of is what? Is it a scroll that you might see if you watch Tehillah uh, Beth Avinu? Uh, synagogue, uh, Shabbat service during our Torah service? Well, that would be wrong. Are you thinking that it's any form of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? That would still be wrong. What is it? Well, let's first talk about, it says, put it next to to put it beside the Ark of the Covenant. So what is in the Ark of the Covenant? Well, obviously, it's the covenant. Now, what is the covenant? Is the Torah the covenant? No. The Torah contains the covenant, but what is the covenant? The covenant is the marriage covenant the covenant is the ketubah. The covenant is the ten words summarization in the ten words of the ketubah of the marriage covenant. So you have the covenant inside the ark. You have the mana inside the ark. And you also have Aaron's budded rod inside the ark. So now, bro brother this Mitch, be brother Mitch. So having two tablets, um, would that be in the case of, you know, anytime you had a marriage covenant, each each party got a um, a copy of the uh, ketubah, right? So having two, you know, some people say, well, you know, part of the ten words was on one tablet and the other part was on the other. Mm -hmm. I think you know, looking at Jewish culture and um, in marriage covenants it would seem that all 10 would be written on each one of them because each party, meaning the father, gets one copy 
of the covenant, and then the Jewish people, the uh, the Israelites, get the other copy. Is that kind of more how it is in Jewish culture? Well, um, I I can only respond to uh, the the one time that I I was married in faith, and we had one ketubah. Okay. And what we did is we, we put it in our bedroom. Um, that's Amen. it. Uh, Amen. So, you know, we had our signs of the covenant, which Shabbat is of the marriage covenant. Sure. And everybody today wears, uh, for the most part, wears wedding rings and given by each um, spouse at the wedding as a token of their love as a token of their covenant relationship with one another. So I, I'm not a hundred percent certain sure. how it's done uh, in Orthodox rabbinic Judaism, but that's what uh, we did uh, many years ago. Amen. Thank you. So, but, so it's take the book of the law and put it beside the ark not in it but beside it so that's outside of it that be for what reason to be a witness against you so the it gets to be interesting and we're going to deal with this as we move into Leviticus and then through the rest of the Torah proper is that with the sin of the molten calf or the golden calf, uh, Hashem provided an instant remedy. If you read Torah carefully and slowly and not being sick, something that happens here, which we're all guilty of, and we do that <clears throat> throughout when we're reading scripture uh, and uh, that that's where the problems with the uh, the Talmud come in because they're written after and so many attempt to put them in the time period and then you say well wait a second look at how this lines up well what is lining up with what it's not scripture lining up with the Talmudic writing. It's the Talmudic lining up with scripture. So my point is simply this, that we go back to uh, Parashat Teruma, and now we're having unfolded for us. Moses is on one of his many trips up at Sinai with Hashem. For the first 40 days and 40 nights. And he's seeing the pattern, he's receiving the instructions, and he remains up on Sinai through uh, Teruma, Tetzeva, uh, Kitese. And now, in, in last week, in uh, Bayekal, He's now come down with the second set of tablets. The first set of tablets were sprinkled with blood. That was the ratification of the marriage covenant. The second set of tablets were made by Moses, not by Hashem, but Hashem still used his finger and wrote the words. Before this time, we have Aaron and his four sons are being consecrated. They're being set apart for the Aaronic priesthood. The Levitic priesthood does not come into play, does not become inaugurated until we actually get into Leviticus. And it happened, the Levitic priesthood came into play because 
now you have all of the Levites serving in the temple because of the sin of the golden calf. So now when you look at James and he writes, if you broke them, if you broke one, you broke them all. Now it makes sense because the book of the law was given to be kept perfectly. It was not part of the covenant. It was added to the covenant. And then from Leviticus, or actually you can see this from Exodus 24, 12 through the rest of the Torah, you can see some of the covenant terms, which are spelled out for us in detail from chapters 21 through 23 in Exodus. You can see some of these terms are sprinkled inside the book of the law. So you have the book of the covenant, and now you have the book of the law added to it. And we know that on the day of Yom HaKippurim, on the day of coverings, the day of atonement, or atonements, Yom Kippur, the Hebrew is really Yom HaKippurim, that was the one time of the year that the high priest could go inside the Holy of Holies, make atonement for himself, make atonement for the people, make atonement for the elements, make atonement for everything related to the tabernacle. And that's why we have the uh, Yom HaKippurim. It wasn't until Yeshua was, or laid down his own life, offered himself up. He who knew no sin became our sin offering. That's the proper rendering of that verse. He did. He who knew no sin did not become sin for us. He became he became the sin offering for us. And so once a year, what would happen? All of the sin that got piled up, kind of like a credit card. You use it, you go to the store, it's credited to your account. At the end of the cycle, you get a statement. And then there's a due date. You either pay in full, or you pay the minimum, or you pay somewhere in between. If you didn't pay the full amount, guess what? You are still owing. Mm -hmm. Yeshua comes. He paid a debt he didn't owe. Why? Because we had a debt we could never pay. We didn't pay. He paid it all when he laid down his life. And how much more? of a friend do we have when one friend lays down his life for So that's number one. Number two is there's also, I believe, a misunderstanding of how all of the supposed or so-called 613 commands relate to us today. And, and what one really needs to come to an understanding about is that all of the commands, all of the the each vote, which are the commands, the each by vote, which are the judgments, and the whole king, which are the statutes. They did not all apply to everybody. You have certain categories of them. You have some that only related when you were in the land. You have some related only for the temple. You have some related only to women. You have some related only to men. You have some related only to the priest 
you have some related only to animals. You have some related only to the hybrid. There is at least, right there, there are seven different categories. There's probably more. Those are the seven that I came up with. Not everybody is a woman. That's easy. Not everybody is a man. That's easy. Not everybody, not every man was a priest. That's easy because you weren't all Levites. Not every Levite was the high priest. There's no more temple stand. We're not in the land. So when you put all of that together, it starts to unravel the, the deep mystery of how do I do this? Okay, how, how, how do you how do you walk toward? It's it starts it really starts where if you Yeshua and the disciples and uh, everybody else for the most part in the Brit Hadashah say it a little bit differently, but they say the same thing. Yeshua says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. That word keep in the Greek comes from the Hebrew shamar. Shamar means observe. Shamar means guard. Shamar doesn't mean keep. Although it has, it can mean that. As well. So we, we start with Shabbat. If we can do one day, one, just think, Shabbat is a weekly practice, a weekly rehearsal for the final show. We have one day a week to rehearse to see if we can get it right. And if we mess up by not observing Shabbat, how are we going to get it right when in the millennial kingdom? I, I, I don't have the answer for that. I don't think that you can just wake up one day and say, oh, here I am. Now when I can do this, we observe Torah. We guard Torah. We Torah. Because he loved us first. And because of his love, we're demonstrating back to him how much we love him by doing as much as we can do for those things that apply to us. And we don't just do them all all at one time. It's impossible. You start in one area and you you realize, oh, you know what? I could do this a little bit better. You close that down. The example that I give is that I would always make brownies on uh, after I came home from work, after sundown, I was cooking on Shabbat. Okay. And then it just so happened that my ride one week called me earlier in the week, my ride to synagogue, called me and told me, I won't be able to pick you up on the normal time. You have to be ready very early this particular Friday. So I'm like, oh, well, there goes the brownies for this week. But then I thought, you know what? What if I made brownies on Thursday? And so I did. And the brownies stay. They're not going to go bad. So I made them and I kept them. And then after that, I said, wow, you know what? Now I can make brownies on Thursday. And when I come home from work on Friday, I have nothing to fret about. It's so easy. It's making those little tiny adjustments. Yep. A little twist here, a little twist there. That's all it is. But you have to start somewhere. If you do not, it will change. Yep. Yeah, so it, it can at times, um, it can at times feel like, uh, the scriptures are contradicting themselves because, you know, Yeshua says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But then you've got James saying here, oh, if you stumble in one, then you're guilty of them all. 
Uh, and so you seem to have, you know, this contradiction uh, going on. Uh, but you have to understand the context from what each one is coming from. I mean, Yeshua is, uh, is plainly stating that the law is eternal and that he, you know, obviously was the giver of the law. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's teaching you how to keep the law when he comes. And so what did, what did James mean by, you know, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of it all. He's not trying to tell you, oh, yeah, so just forget about doing it. He's just trying to make a statement that we are all sinners, that not one of us is sinless. And so that was the whole reason why there was an offering system even given was to also be included in the marriage covenant so that you can walk in righteousness, you know. So uh, we have to be able to take these things within their context, uh, you know, Paul was talking about, you know, not being under the law, you know, we're not, you know, works of the law don't justify us. And if you try and do that, you know, you obviously are going to be out of the kingdom. If, but he's talking about if you try to do the law for your justification, in other words, try to do it absent from Yeshua, of course, you're not going to be justified, right? But that doesn't mean that in Yeshua, you don't do the law. You know, because the law is not about salvation, it's about living in the kingdom. So it's all about the proper perspective of putting things in context um, is always what I try to share with one. And, and that's what you saw Brother Mitch doing, uh, just just going through and he's giving you proper context. So, Brother Mitch, so. could you expand on then the difference between a sacrifice and an offering? We have the korbanot, uh, which is the Hebrew word for offering. Yeah. Well, um, next week, as we get into Leviticus, the first three or first five verses are so packed. And what I um, have done in times past, and I, and I do it again to refresh myself, is I go back and I look at the actual Hebrew words get away from the English because the English many times and in Leviticus, it can be extremely confusing, but the Corbanot was what it, the Corban and uh, was the meaning of it is to bring near. The Corbanot was what you brought near. So what are you doing? But what's the context? The context is the last few verses of Exodus 40. The tabernacle is now built. The glory of Hashem is now on. And uh, actually the cloud is on the tabernacle. But the glory, the Shekinah, is in. Moses has a problem. Moses can't come in. Remember, Moses has spent two separate occasions with Hashem and knows that glory. He knows the presence. He wants to get in, but he can't because the glory has filled the tabernacle. And what is the very first word in the book of Leviticus? It, it's the Hebrew name, Vayikra. And he called. Hashem is calling Moses to do what? To come near, to draw near. And this is the essence of what the offering system was all about. So an offering is bringing something near to make a form of atonement. And there's five different basic offerings. And we're not gonna get into them now. We'll probably get into it a lot deeper in nine and certainly in 10. Um, and Next week for Sunday Night Live, I'll get into the uh, the deeper meanings of the actual Hebrew words that are rendered in English, because it, it just opens, it opened my eyes, just looks like he froze up again. Or 
I did. But I think I think it's on uh, your side, brother. Might have been it. But um, so by using the Hebrew words and understanding the Hebrew meanings, it just unlocks the passage and makes it so clear. And it wasn't until maybe, oh, I'm going to say five, six years ago that I realized that not only do we use wrong terminology like, you know, covenant testament, old and new, um, that we could go on and on and on. Um, but also when we continue to use sacrifice, we have, what's the picture that comes up in our minds, killing something, a bloody mess. Yes. But killing something. And then, when we are continued to be taught from in the church that Yeshua provided his sacrifice, well, what is it? He became suicidal? Uh, he took a knife and cut himself? No, and nothing to do. It's the uh, offering and sacrifice are related, but they're not the same. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've, all, I've always gotten the picture, I mean, when I study pagan uh, sacrifices and so forth, um, often done to manipulate the deity that you are trying to get something from. You're not really trying to draw near to them. You have a request. You're trying to, it's, it's almost a manipulation move. And I don't think that within paganism, they ever really thought they could draw near to those deities. They always looked at themselves as so far away and that deity, you know, uh, and they were fearful. It wasn't about an intimate relationship. It really wasn't about drawing near. It's, hey, I want some of your power. I want you to provide me with a good crop. I want many children. And I'm going to give I'm going to give this sacrifice to get what I want. Um, whereas when I see korbanot and I see offering and, and we, like you said, you look at the root word of it about drawing near and intimacy and everything. And then Yeshua says, you know, there's no greater, um, no greater, uh, act than a man lay down his life for another, right? So that's an offering of your life for another person. And that would obviously be an act of love in the Torah. So, you know, this idea of, you know, you know, Yahweh doesn't accept human sacrifices. Well, yeah, that's not what Yeshua was. He was offering his life in an act of love uh, for other people, for creation. And there's a huge difference there. Yeah, so much so. Um... And I think it's important that, you know, we kind of touch on this because we're going to be talking about Yeshua as high priest, our Kohen Gadol. And so uh, we're going to be talking about what he did for us uh, and what the offering system was weak in and could not do prior to him coming. He was able to do. And so that's that was one of the reasons why I wanted to kind of bring some of this stuff up before we started. Yeah, no, it, it, that's always good. We kind of uh, lay uh, a foundation and we know that, uh, well, w without being braggadocious, when we're laying a foundation, Yeshua, and then all, all that we're doing is we're spreading the wealth, so to speak. We're, we're uh, helping people to see things that probably they've never thought of before, never seen before, maybe read it before, and had no understanding of the real meaning because pretty much the uh, people that we are ministering to at large are coming out of the Western church system. And it, there's uh, just, you know, it's, people ask me all the time, well, what's the difference? And I say, well, okay, you, do you really want to know? Right, <laughs> are, right. Do you really, really, really want to know? Okay, so 
draw three columns of paper, uh, three, just pick up A, B, and C, okay? A, to the left. Let's call that rabbinic Judaism. C, to the right. Let's call that Christianity and any and any and all of the denominations you can think of, however many thousands that there might be. And then in the middle, Messianic Judaism. So let, here's the basic differences. Rabbinic Judaism has the Torah. They do not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Christianity has the indwelling of, I'm making a broad statement now, because people make up the columns. And I can't speak for everybody. And we know that everybody who calls himself a Christian is not of biblical faith. Yeah. So having said that, Christianity, for the most part, has the indwelling of the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, but does not have the Torah, meaning that they have been taught that the Torah is done away with, although in their Bibles they have the Torah. So you can't say you don't have the Torah. And you can't say the Torah is not for me, because if you say that, then a lot of the basic doctrines just go bye-bye. Have the indwelling of the Ruach, indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it is through the Holy Spirit that is now in us, with us, and has sealed us until the day of redemption that we now have become empowered to do what Ephesians 2.10 says, where it starts off and says, we are his workmanship created in Messiah Yeshua for good works. Those good works mentioned by Yeshua in Ephesians 2.10 are the works of the Torah. They're all of the things that we are to do, but it continues to go on. And it says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what are we doing? We're walking in the good works of the Torah. How? by exercising our gifts and walking in our calling. Yep. And please remember, if you guys are listening, I know some of people, and I think we've touched on this before, they'll talk about, well, all I need to do is the royal love of, of God, the royal law of love, you know, mentioned in James chapter 2, or, you know, I just need to follow the law of Christ, which is love. Well, when I ask people to define what that term is, because that's a that's a statement, right? That's a term or a title for something. The minute you start saying that it means, um, you know, to not uh, lie, to not steal, do not commit adultery, you know, uh, in all of these things, you're robbing from the Torah right there. It's all in the Torah. So if you're going to say something is outside of the Torah and all I need to do is the royal you know, law of love, you have to understand that within Judaism of the first century, that was just one way of saying, follow the Torah. That, you know, rather than coming up with all these other ways of saying it, the royal law of love is following the Torah, you know, so you just can't get away from it. It is, um, you know, uh, it's very, very sad that no matter where you turn in the Brit Hadashah, it just all refers back to what came before it, which is the foundation. And the foundation of biblical faith is Yeshua, yep. who is the living Torah. Amen. <clears throat> So let, let's open in prayer and let, we'll get into the word. Amen. So, Abba, we thank you for another day. We thank you for this opportunity that uh, 
two brothers who love you, who know one another personally, um, are able to get together and able to break apart, but put together pieces of the bread of life. And we, we ask your blessing on our time together. Empower us through your Ruach. Give us clarity of mind, clarity of thought, unbridle our tongue. And the words that we would speak would be a blessing to others, but that we would decrease, that you increase through us in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 So, 8-1 in the book of Messianic Jews. Now, this is the main point of the things that we have been saying, which kind of is the summary of what we've been talking about for a better part of an hour now. Yeah. <laughs> but what does it relate to? It relates to everything that came before. The writer is building up in a crescendo. And he's slowly but surely building the peak. We're almost at the top of the peak because in the next few chapters, eight, nine, and 10, they're all about one thing. And it's all about the priesthood. And when we get a little bit further into it, we're going to have to unlock terminology that has been the source of confusion for thousands of years. So this is the main point. What he's been saying before in the first seven chapters, in essence, relates to the deity of Yeshua. But he's now going to be turning right here in 8.1 from Yeshua's credentials, his character and status, as the high priest to the nature of his work. What does he actually do in the heavenly holy place in the heavenly tabernacle that Moses saw a pattern of? What is he going to do now? And so you can say, well, is he sitting or is he standing? Well, why can't he be both? Because we can look at two different scriptures or a group of two different, two different scriptures. And we can see that in Acts 7, uh, 55 and 56, he's standing. But in uh, as we move on into chapter 10, uh, verse 11 through 14, we see him sitting. But regardless of whether he's standing or sitting, where is he? He's at the right-hand side of God, the Father. Because now, where is he? He has been executed. He's been buried. He's been resurrected. And he is now ascended back to where he originated from. He wasn't created. And when I said the word originated, I'm talking about only the source of where he came from, the high heavenly abode. Let's not get it twisted. Yeah, and I think so, it's important that we know that we're going into a section of the Torah, which is not the entire Torah, but the section of the Torah of the priesthood, of the duties of a priest, especially the high priest. And that's going to be the context of what we're uh, sharing on. So making a blanket statement on this being all of the Torah uh, would be uh, a mistake. We're honing in on the context of uh, Yeshua as our Kohen Gadol. Yeah, and... Um, okay. So we have such a high priest, a Kohen Gadol, who is seated, here we go, at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So can you have somebody, let, let's just ask a general question. <clears throat> in all of the, the kingdoms of this world, 
in all of the, the royalty of this world, there's some form of a throne room where the majesty, the king, the queen, the emperor, the empress, whoever it might be, sits on a daily basis. Who can come in to that specific throne room on earth? I'm not talking spiritual realm now, mm -hmm. talking about the physical realm. You can't come in unless you're part of the family, unless you are in fact part of the royalty, unless in fact you have an invitation. Now let's go back to the spiritual. How much more do we have access to the inner place, to the royal majesty? How much more? Much more. Because if we have faith in the biblical Yeshua, we have been granted the access. And let's also not get this twisted. Because as we've talked about many times in the past, and specifically in John's gospel, where the Son of God is being used over and over and over, people still today um, believe that Yeshua is a son of God, like you and I, Tony, are, uh, as I was when my dad was living, a son to my father. And you still are a son to your father. We both have sons. That's not the same type of sonship that's been spoken of here. Right. And that's, that's one of the main things that people just have to get sometimes bashed out of their brain. Get rid of that thought because it's not the same. Son of God is a messianic term. Son of God <clears throat> was used, well, let me put it this way, that who before first century, during the intertestamental period or the intercovenantal inter period, that's a better term, there was a messianic expectation. Nobody knew who the Messiah was going to be. Nobody knew when the Messiah would come, although there were you know, sprinkling here of different prophecies and so forth and so on. But everybody knew, and this is the Jewish world, not the pagans had no wanting to do with anything to do with Jews unless they had already attached themselves to Israel. That, that was it. Other than that, eh, I'm going to go worship my own gods. The messianic expectation throughout the Jewish world was whoever the Messiah is, whenever he comes, we know he will be coming as God in the form of a man. And that is exactly who Yeshua is, what Yeshua did. Not all of his ministry, but he met in full that messianic expectation. Now, the problem became is that the leadership was looking for for a Messiah a, as a, uh, a conquering king to get rid of the yoke of the Roman bondage. And because Yeshua did not meet that or their expectation, and also they didn't want to give up their privilege, they didn't want to give up their prestige, they didn't want to give up their prominence, they didn't want to give up their power over the people. They said, no. Nope. Where did you come from? You didn't come from one of our schools. And they did to him 
back then, what many do today on social media continue to discredit him, either A, rejecting his messiahship or believing he is the messiah and then rejecting his deity. But if you have only the first part, if you accept Yeshua as the messiah but reject his deity, you do not have the biblical Yeshua and what you are doing without you maybe knowing it is you are making God into a mere man. And there then comes the issue, show me in Torah, where God affirms or condones human sacrifice. Now you have an issue. Why? Because of your own thinking thinking because you didn't do your homework you went to rabbi google you went to rabbi youtube uh you went to rabbi facebook you think you are being taught by somebody who knows because it sounds good but because of the lack of of overall discernment. This is not a personal attack against anybody. This is just a general lack of discernment because if you don't understand the background and the backdrop, if you don't understand the basic hermeneutics, the culture, the history, the archeology, span and many times also the, the words that are being used, not the words in English, but the actual Hebrew words that are being translated into English, you're going to come away with something that is not what scripture is teaching. And that this is a major problem. And it's a major problem within the church because although every single pastor that I've ever talked to that has ever attended a Bible college, a Bible institute, or a formal seminary has all gone through a class known as hermeneutics, which is the science of studying or the, uh, the proper interpretation of scripture. And it comes right out of 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't know how to handle the word, then you can't divide the word properly. And if you can't divide the word properly, there's going to be lots of stuff that you're going to be saying, that you're going to be writing, that you're going to be thinking and passing on to others that are just not right. A lot of errant garbage that's out there. And Tony and I continue to say, we're not experts. And we don't think that we are because we know that we're not. We have put in a lot of time and a lot of effort because we wanted to know, both coming from different backgrounds, but both wanting to know, wait a second, this is what I've been taught. This is what I've been thought. This is what I bought and caught. Wait a second. How does this reconcile with scripture? And a lot of times it just didn't. Right. Most of the time it just didn't. <laughs> so you, we, we wish if we could put something in a bottle. And boy, we could retire yesterday. <laughs> we, we could market this online, sell it on Amazon uh, and a whole bunch of other different uh, online portals. And we'd be sitting back just collecting the, the royalties and the, the residuals every, every week and every month. And then we could do this 24 seven. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so going back to uh, the chapter two. So Yeshua is the high priest who's seated 
in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. This is the tabernacle that Moses saw a picture and a pattern of. This is the tabernacle that Yeshua is now ministering in because he is not just the high priest. If you have faith in him, he's now your, he's now our, he's now my high priest. And I think, you know, I mean, let's let's just think logically here for those of you that uh, may be still struggling with the deity of Yeshua. All right, we have um, a tabernacle erected by Yahweh. All right, and uh, is considered holy in His presence. And uh, do we think that any created being's blood would satisfy that holiness of Yahweh? No. It's going to take God himself. And so Yeshua being 100% man and 100% God is the only rightful means by which that tabernacle can be purified. Uh, and so, I mean, it's just common sense to me. I mean, the deity of Yeshua, anything less and the blood is insufficient. It's not going to purify the heavenly tabernacle that was made without without hands well let, let's take it also a, a step further if you believe <clears throat> or they say it differently if you do not believe <clears throat> in yeshua deity then you have no redemption you have no salvation mm -hmm. because that would be what you've done by doing that is you have relegated him to a mere man. So, so why not Tony or I giving you our blood? What would that do for you? Nothing, nothing at all. And we can go and we can point to uh, Psalm 49, I believe it is, uh, that a man cannot buy another redemption. Ransom, redemption. They're interrelated words. Redemption is not a concept that started in the Brit Hadashah. It's a concept that has been throughout the Torah. And it's also, we see it in the book of Leviticus, where redemption really starts to come with the land and then the people because you have the Shemitah and 50 years and that year at Jubilee and then um, so forth and so on. <clears throat> so you were bought back and this is what Yeshua did. But what was the price? Not just his life. Yes, it was his life, but we were bought with a price. The price was his blood. Not my blood. Not animal blood. Animal blood only covered stuff. So you really have to think through what you're really believing by what you say when you reject Yeshua's deity, even if you say, yeah, here's the Messiah. Now, I have a whole slew of ethnic Jewish cousins that are predominantly from the Orthodox persuasion that jump on board and say, yeah, Yeshua is the Messiah. But then when you have a, a little bit more in-depth conversation with them, no, he can't. He's not Hashem. Oh, really? Why do you say that? And for the most part, they come back to, well, show me where it says in Torah that Hashem approves, condones of a human sacrifice. I said, wait a second. You're the one that's bringing the humanity element into it. I'm not talking about his humanity, although he there is an element of humanity. 
you are relegating him only to humanity. And if you read the scripture, he who ascended descended, but then he reascended. <clears throat> so there's always, again, there's always a kernel of truth. Mm -hmm. You got to take away all of the, the junk. And then what you end up with is you have a little smell. You went on mute, brother. <clears throat> so, verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer, not to sacrifice, but to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, Yeshua, have also something else to offer. For, now he gave the what, now he's going to give the why. For, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to Torah, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now, famous words, but now, he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises the covenant that's being spoken of in verse 6 that is better that's a better covenant and has better promises has nothing to do with well it does but it doesn't <clears throat> it's mainly speaking about the priesthood well, yeah, I mean, you can go to Malachi and you can see that uh, Yahweh had a covenant with Levi, right? He made a covenant. So it's a covenant within the covenant made at Sinai. Um, and so obviously we're going to be talking about that covenant uh, in the context here. So a lot of people don't even know the, about the covenant of Levi. They don't know about uh, Pinchas, uh, you know, and the covenant that Yahweh made with with him and his descendants and so forth. So um, obviously they're not really taught that in Western Christianity, not on a Sunday morning from the pulpits or anything. Uh, you might get a little bit of that in Bible college, but they don't really make that connection either. Um, right. But the average person, if you ask them, oh, who was Pinkas? You know, uh, you know, what, what, how is he related, you know, to, uh, to the Bible? 99% won't know. Well, not only that, but it's it's more like Pinkas. Who's that guy? Never yeah. heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, old Phineas. That's why. <laughs> yep. So, uh, but here's something to uh, really dig your teeth into, and that is that there's uh, really is absolutely no conflict whatsoever between the Levitic. Uh, priesthood established by the Torah, uh, okay, through Moses, by Moses' hand. Let's get that straight. And that which Yeshua predicted or indicated in Psalm 110. And it's not necessary to think of Yeshua's priesthood as superseding the Levitical one. And here's why. Because the Torah says that earthly coordinates the earthly priest must be descendants of Levi and Numbers 25 12 <coughs> speaks of God's covenant of an everlasting priesthood that we just referred to Malachi and also Pinchas Phineas okay but who was in fact a great 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 I'm sorry a grandson of Aharon 
But since Yeshua serves in heaven, he can be from the tribe of Judah and also have an eternal ministry, which he does and is, as we saw last time, that he is, in fact, from the tribe of Judah. That's uh, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. And he also has an eternal ministry, verses 23 to 25. So there, there's no contradiction here. Uh -huh. None whatsoever. So maybe we get into uh, a, a little bit more in verse 5 and verse 6, which I appropriate. So I'll hand it off to you for a moment, Tony. I'm getting a little hoarse. So you are you talking about uh, serving as the copy in the shadow of heavenly things, right? <clears throat> so, I mean, obviously Moshe had to, and this was divinely in instructed. Another thing that you might hear, and I heard, you know, rather recently, I had a member of our assembly come up to me and said, you wouldn't believe basically what my boss, and we were talking about the Sinai covenant and the law and this and that, and you know, he basically told me the only thing that really came uh, from Yahweh on Mount Sinai was the 10 words. Everything else is just man-made laws that come after that. And I'm, and my, you know, my, the member of our assembly here, you know, he's talking to his boss. He's like, well, where do you get that from? He's like, everything came from the mouth of Yahweh that came on Mount Sinai. Uh, we call it the law of Moshe simply because he was the one, uh, speaking for Yahweh he was giving the law to the people so uh, <laughs> let's let's keep this you know uh, in its proper perspective all of scripture is God breathed all of the Torah all of the Hebrew scriptures is God breathed the instructions given at Sinai are God breathed why because they are a shadow of the heavenly things they do reflect what is in the heavenlies and so uh, you you know, when we talk about Galatians being a tutor, the Torah was a tutor and the reality of it is Yeshua. That's that lines up right here in, in Hebrews. Right. And so we get the copy in the shadow showing us the reality and the reality is in Yeshua. But in no way does the copy or the shadow become less inferior and contradictory to anything and can still operate also because it still has a purpose, right? It still is a teaching method. It's a teaching tool to teach us the reality of Yeshua. Why would you get rid of it? There is no need to get rid of it. People are still going to need to be taught, still need to be learned the truth about Yeshua. And uh, just having the new covenant scriptures is not enough. It wasn't enough for the first century. So this is why Hebrews is doing what it's doing. It is bringing you through, showing you the copy, the shadow, pointing you to the reality. But in no way is it, uh, you know, doing something that is not the purpose of what it was called to do or created to do. Uh, that purpose of that earthly tabernacle, the Levitical Kohanim, uh, continues to go forward and also, I think you got to remember that that is the Kohanim's inheritance also. That's how they get paid, right? That will continue in the millennial reign. It's their ministry. It's their job duty. And we should be supporting all who are in the kingdom in their ministries and job duties, no matter what they are. We support them uh, because they are glorifying the Father. They are doing his work. And so that's uh, when we talk about this copy and shadow of the heavenlies, we need to be in full support of it because Yeshua's in full support of it. Yahweh's in full support of it. He has a covenant and he's going to keep his covenant with the tribe of Levi. So in no way will me and Bro you'll ever hear me and brother Mitch say, if you believe in the animal offering still continuing, have you in any way degraded Yeshua or made his offering any less? The only way you make it less is if you depend on an animal offering for your salvation, which none of us do that, that none of us in the new covenant do that. So we, we, and that's the importance of understanding the deity of Yeshua. When you understand the deity and believe in the deity of Yeshua, it makes his offering even more substantial in your life, even more foundational uh, in your life and secure that you, 
don't depend on anything else but him for your salvation. Well said. And something <clears throat> that just keeps on ringing through is that Moses is speaking to Hashem, getting the instructions, and then relaying it to the people. Moses is the mediator. Yes. So uh, I hear many, many times from my ethnic Jewish cousins, pre-believers, well, we don't need a mediator. Okay. Uh, you never heard of Moshe before. <laughs> what are you doing all the time? Right, right. Okay. Uh, you know, forget about, I, I know that you won't, pretty much or necessarily be reading anything from the Brit HaDashah because you think that's not for me. And I understand that because I used to believe that. Why? Because that's what was ingrained into me. In fact, and this is really hysterical. It, I, I can say that now. As I'm <clears throat> about the... Uh, a year or two years before, <clears throat> I actually came to faith. I was, uh, I got myself jammed up in uh, major legal issues. And in an attempt to calm myself down, I became addicted to drugs or to a drug. And my drug of choice was crack cocaine. <clears throat> and I put myself in rehab and going through it. And I had a friend who knew of my, as they call it in the 12-step program, a spiritual awakening. Ooh. Now, let, let me say something. <clears throat> I know of many people who have come clean by following the 12 steps, and they are not of faith. Because really, if you work the program, the program will work. If you don't work it, it ain't going to work, just like anything else in life. However, I do know that all of the 12 steps are spiritual principles, which I really didn't know at that time. But when I finally had to serve my 10 months of incarceration, Eventually, I became the head of the combined NAAA meeting right there where I was in the federal prison camp. I'm a new believer. I'm just a couple months old, and I've been designated to lead this group. And I thought it was funny because now I have the book. I have the NA book, and I'm going through it, and I'm seeing how all of this aligns with scripture. And I'm like, wow. But let me go back to beforehand. Going into a bookstore, I want a Bible. I, 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 I want to study the Bible. I have no idea what that means. The only thing that I know, Tanakh. The Tanakh that I was given as a gift at my bar mitzvah was lost in a major car accident a few years before, and I still have the, uh, the souvenir, a steel plate in my left forearm from September of 1990. And we're looking in the bookstore, and there's a Bible section, there's a spirituality section. Every single Bible that I pick up, I, I'm hopeful, and I go like this, and I open it, and it has this New Testament thing. And it's not for me. Not for me. Not for me. Where did I get that from? I got it from my father. What my dad would do, now let's now I'm out of prison. And I'm back in living life, trying to get back into the world, so to speak. And I'm asking uh, my dad to support me with money so that I could buy some Bible references. And he tells me, 
he knows uh, what I believe. He he doesn't doesn't like it, doesn't want it, mm-hmm. thinks that I'm now no longer a Jew, etc. I I have not been disowned, okay. Um, but he's not going to provide it any money to buy Christians. So he asked me, well, "What do you want?" To and I said, well, what I want to do is I want to learn more Hebrew. He said, well, why don't you get your, this is my dad. Why don't you get yourself a Siddur and learn the prayers? Genius. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> now, I knew the Shema, I knew the Via Hafta, you know, but that, a lot of other stuff, man, long gone very long gone so in essence i did that but what i was able to do with a little bit of it, i was able to get some basic hebrew resources that similar to the brit hadashah where there were many 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 uh references available that will take the majority of the English versions give you the Strong's number of the Greek word for the Brit Hadasha. Go back, you can go. And now online, there is a plethora <clears throat> of that, but also for Tanakh. And that's what I wanted. But back then, there, there really was only one available. And so I garnered up enough money, and that became the, the basic foundation of my life from some 28 years ago. And so that's why I'm a, an old-fashioned book guy, because back then, in 93, 94, no such thing as internet, or maybe Gore was just about to invent it and make it readily available to everybody. So I know many people didn't get understand that one, but <laughs> the presidential debates of 2000, you'll hear him say, in 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 part, I invented the internet. <laughs> yes, he did say that. Ay, ay, ay. I think he had um, too much Heinz mustard from Tipper. <laughs> that's another one that you'll have to go deeper into and find mm-hmm. out um, anyway <clears throat> so back to uh, Hebrews so just as the covenant that Yeshua mediates is better, literally is far superior to theirs as the covenant he mediates is better. The covenant which Yeshua mediates is the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant spoken of in Jeremiah, which is quoted as we get further in uh, verses 8 through 12. And it's it's better than the covenant Moses mediated at Sinai as proved by, well, we didn't get all the way here yet, but we started with uh, verse 6 and it goes down to the end of the chapter for the most part. So one of the themes of the book of Hebrews is Yeshua is better yeshua is superior uh and then there's a whole bunch of things that you can you know put in better than the angels better than moses better than the old the old covenant so forth and so on yes he is but no he isn't because yes through progressive revelation we see that we are not hear hear me carefully 
that were not under the sacrificial system, the system of the Levitic offerings anymore today. Why? Because there's no more temple. Will we one day, if we're still alive to see them? Probably not. But down the corridor of time, the offering system will be brought back. And here's a point of confusion, point of contention for many. Well, if Yeshua is our offering, our one-time offering for sin, why do we need that stuff again? Well, we're not executing Yeshua again, and it would have absolutely nothing to do with his offering when he laid down his life. It is memorial, but then also the other offerings that were given, some had nothing to do with sin. Yep, and it's about the integrity of the words of Yeshua in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 19. It's the integrity of him being a covenant-keeping God. I mean, uh, that has a lot to do with it. Um, and when Paul says that, it, you know, that the law is holy, righteous, and good, why would anyone have a problem if it did continue? That's That really needs to be the question, you know. Very true. Very true. So, okay. So now we're at verse 7. And here's where we get into a lot of trouble. With what we've been taught. And because of what we've been taught, what we've caught, and what we've bought. But also because of those three things, what we continue to think or what we have been, what we have thought as well <clears throat> now here's the point i'm going to read it first for if that first in many bibles except for a lot of um well there's a lot of english renderings that do not have italicized words why the publishers don't italicize the words right to them, I have no clue. I really don't. But as Tony rightly said, and as we have emphasized in times past, whenever you see an italicized word in English as any part of the scripture, it is the intentions of the translators to provide clarity. Here's the problem. Many times the clarity that they are attempting to provide is clarity only from their theological bases, which would necessarily be biased, although unknowingly at that. Although Many times, the italicized words are, in fact, from an outright bias. What am I talking about? So let's unpack this verse. Okay. Now, when you see an italicized word, you can do, line it out. So you can erase it. Just put a little line in there. So we're going to read 8-7 without the italicized word covenant. For if that first had been faultless, then no place would be thought for a second. Okay. So we've indicated and re-emphasized that the word covenant does not appear in the original. It's not there. It right. was. Okay. Yep. 
true. The problem with inserting covenant where it doesn't belong is that the writer of Hebrews is at times speaking of broad terms of both Tanakh and Brit Hadashah. But at other times, he's actually speaking in the narrower view. So it's like, well, why can't, why couldn't he be more specific? Guess what? Um, when Yeshua returns, we'll not only find out who the real writer of the book of Hebrews was, mm -hmm. if you do not believe it's Shaul, but probably there'll be a very long line and you'll be eventually able to ask them yourself. But in broad terms, or rather in narrower terms, speaking of the tabernacle, also of the priesthood. So that's the confusion. But still at other times, he's talking about the concepts of this world, which is Elam Hazeh, the present world, and the world to come, the Alam Haba. So what they've done is in trying to uh, remain consistent, they've used one word. And in the attempt of attempting to be consistent, it creates confusion because the translators, remember, the, the first English version of the Bible, uh, probably Tyndale, or there might have been some something uh, before him, maybe Wycliffe, I get the history, historical order of English translation. But we're not, we're talking about something that did occur until some 1500 years after Yeshua. 1500 years after. Right. Okay. So there's, there's really nobody at this time that understands Jewish things. Where was the translation being rendered? In England. It's the height of anti-Semitism. You have Spain, you have France, you have England, you have all of that portion of Europe, anti-Semitic. You have, it's the, kind of like the, the Renaissance, but the Middle Ages, it's kind of like the Dark Ages too. And during this period of time, there's lots of persecution going on of the Jewish people as it continues today in different parts of the world. And so you really have to understand the, the bias that has existed within the Western church for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. So also, we have to look at uh, the word first, okay? So the Greek word first is protos. And then there's another word that's used, second, it's uh, deuteros. And we kind of know that word because that's where we get Deuteronomy from. Although Deuteronomy from that root is the second law and it really isn't because <laughs> there's one law we're not talking about one law of theology which means all right let me stop i always Maybe put kind of put it in a manner of you know uh a re reiterating it i mean he reread what was already there so it's a second reading in a sense it's, that's kind of how i've always kind of explained it well, it's better in Hebrew because the, the word oh, is definitely, these are the words. Yeah. <laughs> so it yeah. becomes really clear. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but the, the so the, the second word uh, is second, 
and that's deuteros. <clears throat> so when we're reading this without any knowledge, just reading it for uh, on our own, but then if we're sitting in church and we're being, uh, there's a series of messages or we're in a Bible study, whatever it may have been or might still be, you come here and you're hearing your beloved pastor, your beloved radio preacher, your beloved teacher saying things that are just not true, using a paradigm that doesn't exist. Because what has been taught for very, very long and is proven through the history of the church proper is that the church has divorced itself from its Jewish roots. And because of that, you're not looking at scripture, you're not being taught scripture from the Jewish lens. And who were the writers of scripture? All Jews. Want to say Hebrews? Want to say Hebrews? Fill in the blank. Three words, three terms, three adjectives, three nouns. They're used interchangeably throughout Rehadasha by Shaul. Makes no difference. Don't get hung up on the terminology between what I'm not a Jew, I'm an Israelite. Okay, big deal. Are an Israelite. Are, are you really a part of the Commonwealth of Israel? Uh, are you really following the Constitution of Israel, of which you say you're an Israelite? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you, in fact, say that you're a Hebrew, what have you crossed over from, and what are you now crossed into? What are you following? You see, this life that we live, um, spirit-filled life being indwelt by the Ruach with soul written on the heart is a very simple childlike game of follow the leader. So the question now is, who is the one that's leading you that you're following? Now the, the knee-jerk reaction is Yeshua. Really? Okay. How does your life demonstrate what you just said? What are your actions? What are your words? What are your thoughts? Those, those are the telltale sign to others who do not know you. And this is where we run into a problem today with social media because we have a lot of so-called teachers with a lot of chatter who think, well, anybody has a platform on social media. It used to be in the old days, the only one that had a platform was those that could afford it and buy radio time or TV time or cable time or satellite. Now, all you need is an internet connection, create a Facebook page for yourself or for your ministry or, or any other, uh, many other platforms that are out there. And now you have a platform and you can say whatever you want because of free speech. And yes, we have free speech. However, is what you are teaching, does it line up with mm -hmm. the world? How does it reconcile? And when you've been around for a while and you don't know anybody, okay, all that you know about the person is because you haven't seen them in person, you don't have any real life relationship with them. 
you communicate with them, so forth and so on. But you're, you're not on the phone. You're not having FaceTime. You're, you're communicating through writing. And it's the writing that's the dead giveaway as to where somebody is. And here's what happens 99 and 44 percent of the time. Somebody who is a little off will say something. That's their what. And from time to time, what I will do is I will say, for clarification, what did you mean by, and I'll quote them, for, for clarification, how does this, quote, what you just said, reconcile with the scripture? And then the argument starts. And the argument always comes down to when they cannot steer you away from what you know is the absolute truth. It's true, not because I want to believe it. It's not true because I believe it, although it is, but it's absolutely true because it was true before I understood it was true. And it will be true long after I'm dead, buried, and gone. That's an absolute truth. The example I always give is one and one is always two. It can't be three. It can't be five. It can't be 12. It cannot be any other number. It's an absolute truth that one and one is two. However, here's an example that shows you the folly of people. Little Johnny goes to kindergarten. You're doing numbers. Learning how to count. Johnny's doing great in every area. Spelling, reading, writing. But when it comes to arithmetic, Johnny can't get it right for some reason. The teacher has a problem. The teacher calls a parent, come. Hey, you know, what's going on? As you would if you're out of the blue, the teacher says, hey, I need to see you. Come on in. So Mr. or Mrs. Smith come in and they sit down with the teacher. And Johnny's there too. What's the problem? Mr. or Mrs. Smith say to the teacher, well, Johnny has a problem with arithmetic. Oh, what's the problem? Well, Johnny somehow thinks uh, that one and one is five. And Mr. and Mrs. Smith look at one another, and now they're puzzled. And they say to the teacher, yeah, one and one is five. Do you get my point? Yep. That's it. Yep. Where did you get it from, and what was it based on? Now, who are you hearing a lot of these things from? When I grew up, I learned it's almost like a built-in anti-J gene or an anti-Y gene, an anti-Jesus, an anti-Yeshua gene, that that guy is not for us. Who is telling me this? My parents, my grandparents, my aunts and my uncles, people who love me, people who want the best for me, people who know a lot more than I do. What did I do? I bought it, hook, line, and sinker until such time that I decided to think for myself and perform my own due diligence. And I found, shockingly, that I was lied to for the first 40 years, four months, and one day of my life. Because I thought for myself. I read the scripture for myself. I came to the understanding by reading the word without any 
preconceived notions because I had a pure heart and I wanted to know if these things were true. Now, was I steered to a direction of what to read? Yes. Did I have a slew of questions? Yes. Did I ask the questions? Yup. Was I afraid of being called dumb, stupid, or silly because I asked a question? No. Why? Because when you're learning, if you have good, loving teachers, they will not condemn you for asking a question. They will encourage you to ask questions, and they will state over and over and over again, there is no dumb, there's no stupid, there's no silly question at all in the world, except the one that you've chosen not to ask. And the reason that you haven't asked the question comes down to one thing and one thing only, pride. You want to know, but you don't have it in you to say, I don't know, and I really want to know. That's the difference. You bring this home a little bit. So now my I'm in prison camp. My dad is coming to visit me. Comes the first time. I have this big stack. What this cannot with me? Says, "What? Let me get into this discussion." And what I realized that I was doing without opening it and reading it, as I was preaching to him, actually giving him my version of Peter's sermon on the day of when Shavuot had fully come. And we get into it, and he comes back the second time. And then the third time, it's, I don't know why I keep on coming back. And I, I turned to him with a big smile on my face. And I said, Dad, it's real simple. Two reasons. Number one, you love me. And number two, you want to hear more about Yeshua. <laughs> when I came out, we got into other discussions. And at one point, I said to him, Dad, now my father was a very astute businessman. Uh, some of you may know the name Wexler Coffee, or it used to be Holloway Coffee, or uh, Neff in different parts of the country. My dad was uh, the executive vice president, the CFO, the VP of finance, and all of those titles, etc., of Wexler Coffee. And through mergers and acquisitions, the company grew. So I said to him, Dad, when you were buying all of these companies, um, and somebody said, well, here, Write me a check for a million dollars. Would you just cut the check? He said, of course not. Now, I already knew the answer. Of course not. Well, so what would you do? And he looks at me kind of quizzically and says, you know, like flip them. Well, we would do our due diligence. I said, oh, and then, so when you found out that the company was worth less than that, you would negotiate? Yeah, or we'd just walk away. Well, what if you found out that the company was more than that? Well, we would try to write the check real quick. I said, okay. So you did due diligence when you were buying a company, right? Or trying to, when you were interested. Yeah. Dad, have you done any due diligence regarding Yeshua? None. None, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's the same thing. The parents... We've taught Johnny one and one is five. No due diligence. Yep. You didn't read it for yourself. But it's not so much just reading it for yourself. It's reading it and then having questions and asking questions of people who have been demonstrated are trustworthy. Not any Billy, Bob, and Joey or Nancy and uh, whoever else is out there because I'm an equal opportunity offender. And I, I, I let, let me clear that up for a moment. I have no problem with my sister 
because I've learned so much from my sisters in the Lord because they have a completely different outlook because I have a man brain and they don't. And I have come to a place in my life that I understand that I can learn anything from anybody as long as I know that it's reconciling with the world. Now, I'm in a, in a situation where I work where there's a lot of stuff that is being brought in with uh, the mindset. And I, you know, I've been through sales training before and all of this stuff. And it, for the most part, it's all worldly. And I have no time for that. Mm -hmm. I don't want any part of it. I know that what I need to do is I need to renew my mind. That That's where all of this stuff comes from. Romans 12, too. So I have, I, I'm supposed to uh, read a portion of Napoleon Hill, you know, Think and Grow Rich, 10 Principles, and Be Prepared uh, for a Discussion Tomorrow. And I'm like, uh, and I've already played the tape in my mind. When it comes time to me, Mitch, did you did you read? Or you uh, said no? Well, why not? I, I I don't have the time. What do you mean you don't have the time? Thank you for the forum to share with me what you have done since you come on board. Is you teach yoga? Well, guess what I do? I teach Bible. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. Right. But anyway. No, and so what I do a lot when I'm teaching is I draw from my own personal experiences, which, and, and <laughs> trust me, you don't want to be in my shoes. You, you wouldn't have wanted to walk where I've walked my entire life. You, you really wouldn't. I wish that I could go back in time, knowing what I know now, and put me back in time a good 20, 25, 30 years ago. It can't happen. All right. Okay. So, there's a uh, very uh, cute little saying uh, that I believe and that I teach, and that is you're not responsible for where you came from you are responsible for who you become Absolutely. we all have the power if we have the power of the Ruach to be transformed from whatever we used to be I, I have a uh, a new Facebook friend that just found me somehow, uh, uh, actually found synagogue, and now he's asking me questions. He, uh, as we started to share, uh, I, I can't remember the name of the island country, but he's off the coast of East Africa, uh, Madesh or something like that. I, anyway, but he's considered part of Africa. And he was sharing with me that he used to be a Satanist. So I said, wow, you really came out of the darkness and now walk in the marvelous light. He's given me a clear testimony. And what he's now in the attempting to do is little by little by little by little transforming his church into messianic congregation. And, you know, we, we've, we've talked and, you know, we've shared and I told them, you know, listen, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but you know what? What I've decided to do for one of the first times in my life is follow the book. There's a, it's all, there's a manual that's in here that if you follow it, you can't go wrong. Now, if you'll prosper, that's a whole nother thing, but at least you're doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. We talk right. about the sponsorship and small groups, and you know it's not about the current generation; it's about those behind us, etc. So we have basic concepts now, 
And uh, we had a conversation yesterday about the Moedim in Leviticus 23. And he said, you know, I, I, we're starting to learn. We, we have so much to understand. Uh, well, I can help you a little bit. So, you know, I sent them some basic tools. It started to have a really good grasp from an overview and a little bit depth. And there's uh, a really good resource uh, that I found years ago that helped me, and which I consider the primer. I wouldn't uh, recommend everything anymore that he writes or that he's involved with because he's off with one law, two houses. And what I was saying before is that a lot of these theological terms, one law doesn't mean what it sounds like. Two houses doesn't mean what it sounds like. And there's other theological terms that are being used in a broad sense yeah. that do not mean what they sound like. Yeah. Because if somebody comes to you and says to you, do you believe in the two houses of Israel? You'll say, of course, it's in the Bible. That's not what it means, mm -hmm. theologically. And if someone says to you, do you believe in one law? And you'll say, of course, there's only one law. That's not what it means. One law means that there's one Torah for the Gentiles, one law for the Gentiles, and one law, one Torah for the Jews. It's covenant theology. And that's what, in essence, the Noahide law is doing. There's one way for Jews to be in covenant. There's another way for the Gentiles, those from the nations, to enter into covenant. And all you have to do is obey the seven Noahide laws. Poppycock and boulder dash. Mm -hmm. it gave everybody the Bronx cheer. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we, we got off on a tangent there for a, a long time. Tangents so, are good sometimes. Yeah. Um, it helps people to relate and it helps people to understand where we're coming from. And uh, uh, I believe it helps them to, uh, you know, grow in a relationship of understanding the speaker. So I, I don't have any problem with it. I learn more about you every time. <laughs> I, I, I go back to uh, a lot of uh, life circumstances and uh, sure, you know, things that I just pop up that I haven't talked about before. But anyway, so this section from uh, verse seven through the end of the chapter, verse thirteen in chapter eight, this is now we're being set up. This is the the, flat, the main point that I talked about. This, that's what was before, the character, the, the priesthood, et cetera, of Yeshua. And now the platform, the plateau is being built. And now we're going into the new covenant. So what does he need to do first? He needs to talk about this new covenant. And then he's going to really explain what this new covenant is. So it's, it's, it's a perfect way of teaching. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Now I'm going to tell, now I'm going to break it down for you. Right. And then when we're finished, I'm going to summarize what I told you. And by then you have had heard it at least three different times. And so if you have heard it three times and you were taking notes, you have at least two of the three ways that people learn. Absolutely. Which is why I emphasize all of the time when you're coming to any form of a study, when you're coming to a, any form of a corporate gathering, whether it's a home group, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, bring a notebook, bring something to write on and something to write with because there's, and also be prepared come to receive there will always be something for you to receive so if 
For if that first priesthood had been faultless, there would be no, then no place would have been sought for a second priesthood. Yeah. I think it's you know important to focus that that is the priesthood because it was um, being done by uh, you know um, fallible men, whereas if you just look at the Torah in general, the Torah is faultless. I mean, when you look at the um, uh, Psalm nineteen seven, you know it says it's perfect, converting the soul. So you have to, this is what really convinces me this is speaking of the priesthood. Because when, when I think of the priesthood, I think of, in fa you know, fallible men that make mistakes and so forth. And, uh, and that can't happen in Yahweh's economy because he has nothing but perfection, you know. So uh, it needs to be something greater and uh, perfect. It needs to be, have a perfect priesthood with the perfect high priest. Well, yeah, uh, starting off in verse 8. So we've identified what the first and the second is. It's not the first covenant. It's not the old covenant. It's not the older covenant. It's not the Old Testament. It's not the older Testament. And the second, likewise, is not the second covenant. It's not the newer covenant. It's not the New Testament. And it's not the older testament either, or the newer testament either but because finding fault with them what is the them the them can't be torah the them can't be the uh, old testament the older covenant that that the, why would we use a personal pronoun to discuss an inanimate object mm -hmm. right it makes no sense no. it's just this logical thinking from english language so a lot of these things that tony and i talk about it's like okay just read and meditate read and think so ask yourself them well, there's no people being spoken of here in verse 7. The only people that are being spoken of is the high priest. Oh, there's a clue. Uh, Moses, that's a clue. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hashem, that's a clue. Yeshua is not mentioned. He's inferred. So we know that Yeshua, there's no fault in him. Right. We know that with Hashem, there's no fault in him. Uh, the high priest, yeah, well, he was just a man. And Moses, well, he was just a man. Right. So, okay. So how could it possibly be that it was the Old Testament, the Older Covenant, or any covenant whatsoever, except if it relates to the first priesthood, which in context of what we've been talking about, is the Aaronic priesthood, which became the Levitic priesthood. So now, what is he going to do in 8, 9, 10, and 11, uh, well, actually through 12, and this, this is going to be fun. He now refers us back to Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. And if you overlay them word for word, <clears throat> you'll see just a little bit of a difference because it's the difference between Hebrew into Greek and then into English. That's all. So... We're go he is now, the writer is now going to bring us back to the new covenant, the Brit HaTashah is what the Hebrew reads of Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34. And he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I will make a new covenant. Listen, 
with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them up out of the hand of Egypt because they did not continue in the covenant. If they did not continue in the covenant, what does that mean? They broke the covenant. What was the covenant which they broke? Just throwing out questions, we'll come back and answer. Mm -hmm. They did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant. He says, it's not that one. I, I made a covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel, which they broke which they disregarded, or they uh, did not continue in, so I disregarded them. But this is, or for this is the covenant that I will make, future tense, and here we get into a bunch of theological issues which get to be fun, but let's just continue reading. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws, I will put my Torah in their mind and write them. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all know me, least of them to the greatest of them, for I will, verse 12. Be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. What about them? So this covenant that was made, we're talking about the initial covenant. Not with Abraham, although that was an initial thing. Talking about the marriage covenant. The marriage covenant was broken with the sin of the molten or golden calf. When he says, that's when he says here in verse 9, that they did not continue in my covenant. Now, what has happened at this point? At this point in time, the covenant, the marriage covenant was given at Sinai. There was, there was no such thing as the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It was only one people, collectively, if you will, the house of Israel. And many times throughout the scripture, we have problems with determining what words mean in the context. What does Jew mean? What does house mean? What does Israel mean? It can mean a lot of different things. Is it a person? Is it a group? Is it a tribe? Is it a nation? Is it a kingdom? And all of those answers will be dependent upon the scripture in which it's being referred to. So what has occurred? Here we are, remember, we're way after Yeshua's was executed. But even before that, we had the marriage covenant given, the marriage covenant broken, when it says in 9 that I disregarded him. He did for a moment. This is where Moses is pleading with Hashem. And this is where we get the 13 attributes of God. From. And Moses is pleading and basically, he's pleading based on what? Based upon the covenant that was given to Abraham, reaffirmed to Isaac, and reaffirmed one more time to Jacob, a.k.a. Israel. Marriage covenant was broken. There was no divorce. They come back together. And now they have gone in different directions. As a one-time unified people, the kingdom has been separated after Solomon's death. Now we have a northern kingdom. 
we have the children. We have Samaria to the north. We have Jerusalem to the south. We have Judah. And we have Ephraim. And here's where today we have theological issues that are only created because people do not understand the history of Israel proper, of the Jewish people, and we'll read Torah, we'll forget about the prophets, and then we'll get into the Bible. I want to re-emphasize, as we did, when uh, we spent a long time talking about no divorce. There was no divorce. Now, my ethnic Jewish cousins, for the most part, will say, you see, this can have happened already because Number one, not everybody knows the Lord. Okay. And yes, this has a future fulfillment down the corridor of time. This is where Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31 intersect. And those two chapters are, in essence, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. When you go through 31 in Jeremiah and 36 in Ezekiel, you'll come up and away with six to eight different major points. And you'll see that those major points all emanate all original with the covenant originally given to him. So that's why my ethnic Jewish people will say that no, it, this is not fulfilled. This didn't happen today. It's not today at all. But we do know through the progressive revelation of Scripture that the new covenant was inaugurated was initiated, was originated through Yeshua's execution on the tree when he ratified the covenant with his covenants have four major parts. Acceptance, the shedding of blood, the ratification, and then a covenant with that is exactly what is commonly referred to as Yeshua's Last Supper did in this Pesach. One last point. When we're reading in the Gospel, Yeshua takes the cup, he blesses it, and says, do this. And he takes the bread and blesses it and says, do this. The context of doing this not Shabbat, it's not Sunday, it's Pesach. What is the this Yeshua was referring to when he lifts up the cup and he lifts up the bread? Pesach. Mm -hmm. So what is commonly referred to as the Lord's table is not Shabbat. It's not communion, although that's what the church believes because of being divorced from their Jewish group. And this is what we've always done. So now somebody comes along and attempts to share something that's different. No, now you're a Judaizer and now you're a legalist. And really, who is the one that's the Judaizer? And really, who is the one that's a legalist? So what happens on Shabbat is really a sanctification. We, we have two loaves of bread because of what we 
thing with the banana head, I mean, you get into a whole bunch of different symbolism. But the, uh, the wine or the juice that's being blessed or being prayed over, they are for him. It's really sanctifying Shabbat. <clears throat> So we enter in, so Yeshua initiated the covenant, the new covenant. And how do we enter into the new covenant? We enter into the new covenant by grace, through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Real simple. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So what does 8 teach? What does say God? What does 9 teach? But we're not saved by. But what does 10 teach? Take them, please, all together. And you have another one of what I refer to as the Holy Trifecta. It teaches what we're saved for. We're saved for good things. Yep. Yeah, we're saved to live in the kingdom. I mean, do kingdom living, right? Learning how to love one another. And love Yahweh. Oh, but that's the royal law of love. I know. <laughs> so that you do anything but love anybody. <laughs> yeah. And again, we got to define love. And the only way you can define love is to revert back to the Torah. The Torah teaches you what love is. So yeah. can't get away from it. Uh-huh. So um, that kind of really does it. For, I mean, we could really get deeper into the New Covenant um, or the Brit Honda show. One thing I want to point out, yeah. there are our, there, there's the, the funny people, or as one of our friends would say, the goofy people uh, who are, get caught up in the sacred name movement. And again, that's a theological term that doesn't mean what it sounds like. Because you hear a sacred name movement, oh, I wanna do that. Well, when you find out what it is, you don't wanna have anything to do with it, trust me. And in essence, there's very well intended, but extremely misinformed people who in essence, do not have any Hebrew or biblical Hebrew training, know nothing about basic Hebrew rules of grammar and make up stuff as they go. And it demonstrated over and over again. And I say this not to be demeaning, just to call it to people's attention. But what I have seen uh, dealing with this errant nonsense that's out there is that over the past 10 years, what I have seen is that this sacred name movement <clears throat> is a gateway to believing that a lot of English words that we use every day, you can't say them, especially because they're in the Bible, because they relate to pagan deities. And therefore what ends up happening is almost everyone that I have encountered that gets caught up in this errant sacred name movement, which is really cult, cultic. It really is cult-like. It's a gateway into this paganism stuff. And one of the things that they say is you can't use the word God because it's a pagan deity meaning fortune. How do you spell God in Hebrew? And they can't. And then they'll say that you can't use Lord, or rather you can't use Baal, because that's another pagan deity. And so to that one, I say, well, the Hebrew word for Baal, it's actually pronounced Baal, is uh, Bet Aleph Lamed. Now, that's the root. And like English, we have root words and then we have prefixes and we have suffixes and Hebrew works the same way. If you go to Jeremiah 31 
And in verse 32, he says, <clears throat> not like the covenant which they broke, which I was, and I'm going to say it in Hebrew now, which I was the Baal T. Even though I was their Baal T. So I say to these well meaning, but equally misinformed sacred namers if what you're saying is true regarding Lord, and you can't use Lord, number one, who is speaking in, who is the one that's actually speaking in Jeremiah 31? specifically in 31 through 34 and they'll say jeremiah and you know that they're that's not right because jeremiah is speaking the words of hashem and then you get into 32 it's clear who is speaking it is hashem and he says although they broke the covenant although i was a husband to them says the Lord. If what you're saying is true, that Baal is a pagan deity, why would it be that Hashem is referring to himself as a pagan deity? Help me. Please help me. Mm -hmm. All right. And there's no answer. Yeah. Um, there, I, I, I have to tell this one. I don't know who this guy is. I've only come in contact with him once for a short period of time. He created a Facebook page, me and my father. And he writes, he has tests all things, and blah, blah, blah. It has nothing to do with that ministry. So he's, he's putting a bunch of stuff and he's using the typical means that the sacred name is due because they do not know the proper pronunciation of consonants or vowels. They make up words. And it, it's one of those yabba dabba dabba. Okay? So I, I wrote to him and I said, you know, uh, one of the things that you should test is the Hebrew language because you're demonstrating that you don't know. Oh boy, did I step on somebody's foot. Oh yeah. Okay. And you don't know what you're talking about. And I know more Hebrew than you. Oh, okay. Maybe you do. So I copy paste something. Very simple one that had just come from the Torah portion. And it, and it was uh, Exodus 35 1. And it's basically, and, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I mean, it was really basic Hebrew, no response, except, well, you have a Hebrew keyboard and I don't. Okay, so why don't you at least attempt to learn Hebrew? Well, and, and he's not answering any of my questions, but throwing barbs at me. And ultimately he says, you, you haven't answered my question. When you did take the time to read what I wrote, you will see, and in our interaction, I was the one that first asked you. You have not responded. When you respond, then I'll consider responding, but I will only take one issue at a time from what you have written. And all I know about you have demonstrated that you do not know anything about biblical Hebrew. And of course, I know more than you, no problem. Many people do. And you don't know any Hebrew, and I do. Well, that's wrong, because I know a lot of Hebrew. I don't, I can't, I'm not, I'm not fluent in Hebrew, but I know a lot of Hebrew words. I can read, not fluently, not all the time, but I can work my way through it. And, We got into the Jew thing. <laughs> so ultimately, all of these things come down to if they can't get at you one way, they're going to come at you or at your character. Mm -hmm. We talked about that at the beginning. Yeah. So it's um, sadly, it, 
it's never ending. And what what happened uh, just yesterday, as I'm uh, I got home from work, I'm going through Facebook. He invited me into that group. <laughs> Decline. Sorry, I, I'm not going to waste my time. Right. I don't have the time. So that's it. Yeah, I would. Um... I would remind people that, uh, you know, especially when we get down here into verse 13, where it says uh, that the new, and you got covenant in italics again. So the new, again, is speaking of the high priestly position, which Yeshua is our Kohen Gadol. It says he has made the first obsolete. Okay. The Greek word there can be rendered in different ways. Obsolete is one option, but obsolete doesn't fit the context. And so it can just simply mean he has made the first old. Now what is becoming old and growing old, or I should say what is becoming old, is ready to vanish. Okay, And uh, at the only reason why something is going to vanish at the end is because there's going to come a day and time when there will be no more animal offerings. There will be no more death. So you know and can understand when the actual vanishing will happen. And that is, there's not going to be any more death happening. There's not going to be any more animal offerings happening uh, at that time, which, of course, is after the White Throne Judgment. So um, we do know, and this is something that Western Christianity just simply doesn't have an answer for, and that is when we're still talking about the uh, idea of this verse here in 13, whether or not it's obsolete or just growing old, all you have to do is go to Ezekiel 11 and Ezekiel 36. And where it says that Yahweh will replace that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and then he will give you a new spirit. He'll pour out a new spirit upon you. He'll cleanse you and so forth. Look at the context. It is the nation of Israel he is doing it to. I know Western Christianity likes to say, look at me, this is me, he's doing this to me. Ignoring the context. It's the nation of Israel and what happens after they are cleansed and given a heart of flesh. They begin to keep the Torah. They begin to keep the law of Moshe in the way they were always called to. So it is not the end. And this also supports what Brother Mitch was saying. He, the new covenant has been inaugurated. We're in it, and yet it is still being fulfilled more. We're not quite yet to verse 11, where no one has to teach their neighbor. But the fact that we are in it and we are growing towards that fulfillment is the actual consistent way of looking at these scriptures. Um, you can't get around Ezekiel 36. It's, it's for Israel. So the word obsolete here in chapter uh, 8, verse 13, is the wrong English word to use, is how I like to put it. No question about it. And here would be uh, using Ezekiel 11 and 36 would be another uh, one of, uh, sadly, uh, one of many uh, different sections or portions of scripture where the the church is using an application as the teaching mm -hmm. and similarly and, and here here's the biggest offense in uh, matthew 28 19 to 20 the the application that has become the teaching is go out and preach. Nowhere in those two verses does it say to go and evangelize. It says go, but what does it say go and do? It says go and make disciples. And here's what people uh, miss is that again, Jewish people, and who's speaking? <laughs> Yeshua. 
the right. greatest Jew who ever physically lived. Jewish people, or a, a Jew, the Jewish Messiah, speaking to his Jewish disciples, telling them what to do. And I've, I've written a little thing, uh, it's a great omission, which I'll gladly make available to anybody. Just uh, write in to me directly or uh, post it here on the video and, and we'll get it to you. But what happens is you take the word and in the church, you, you rush to make application, forgetting about the exegesis, but pointing always to the eisegesis and you come away with something that scripture doesn't teach. Now, again, there's a kernel of truth to what is being taught, but it is not the truth. It's part of the truth. And this is what Tony and I continue to basically every time we're together talk about is context, context, context. Yeah. Exegesis, exegesis, exegesis. Proper hermeneutics, proper hermeneutics, proper hermeneutics. And get away from the eisegesis, the eisegesis, the eisegesis. <clears throat> and when you do that and you train yourself, and it, it's a discipline, but it starts somewhere. Start training yourself with putting yourself in the context in which you're reading not from a separated 2022 mindset put yourself in there what's going on what is it that i know what 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 came before me that's only available to the people here then not what i already has been revealed throughout scripture it's a process it's difficult to do at first but like everything else the first time you do it you'll come back and you'll say you know what that wasn't so bad i can do this mm -hmm. and then the more you do it the more it becomes second nature but always when you're coming to scripture, ask the basic questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? These questions are your friends. They will help you to unlock scripture, help you to have a deeper meaning, help you to get closer to the actual truth, but certainly to the context of what the scripture is. And you can do it. Yep. Amen. Anybody can. Amen. So this will uh, wrap up chapter eight for us today. We'll, we'll uh, next time together next week, we will go into Hebrews chapter nine. And of course, as we uh, bring this to a close, we definitely are still praying for everyone involved in this new war that is going on. Uh, unfortunately, so many innocent people are being affected by this power struggle of these elites that uh, want to control everything. All right. And so they're not bowing and submitting to the kingship of Yeshua. And this is what the end result is. People want to become gods themselves and they think they know best for the entire world. So we continue to pray for those who are um, in Yeshua who are ministering the gospel in these countries, Russia, Ukraine, and all around. And we pray that the message of the gospel will continue to go out, even though this tragedy is happening to millions of people. Amen. So Amen. we'll go, go ahead and go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and honor, Lord. We lift up the countries that are involved in this war. Lord, you know the innocent ones. You know the guilty ones, Father. You are our righteous judge. And Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will uh, strengthen those believers that are in this, these countries, that they can stand on your word, that they will see the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives to minister love 
one to another, Lord, to help one another through this time to make wise decisions. And Lord, we know that you are working all things towards your good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose, Lord. And so we pray that your will be done and that your kingdom will be advanced in many of the lives of the Ukrainians and the Russians, Lord, and those that are being affected. In Yeshua's name, amen. Blessed are you, our Lord, our God, King of the Sorry. universe, gave us the Torah of truth, Yeshua, our Messiah, and set everlasting life in our midst. Blessed are you, our Lord, giver of the Torah. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. It's been a joy, and it's been uh, um, just a lot of fun. I mean, I love just going through the Word and just uh, pounding at it and uh, bouncing things off of one another, so. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we have, and we will continue next week. So, shalom, everyone. Shalom and Shavuotov.